Track down a Bible if you can and get with me to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. And uh, over the next several weeks, we'll be looking at the life of Abraham. Abraham. He's called Abram here. Um, But we're looking at uh, this idea of trusting, trusting an unknown future to a known God. Uh, There's uncertainty for sure in the days ahead, but uh, we know who holds the future in his hands, and so we want to look at the life of Abraham as a man of faith uh, who went through some very challenging situations and heard the voice of God and responded uh, appropriately. So Genesis chapter 12, we'll read the text, we'll pray, and then we'll get to work. Genesis 12, starting in verse 1, the Lord had said to Abram, Go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran, and they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moriah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Let's pray. Lord, we ask right now that you would use this time to help each of us hear your voice. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to respond with obedience of faith. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's look at this under three different headings. Let's look at the call of God, the commitment to God, and communion with God. The call of God comes on the front end, and it is a call from God to a man named Abram, and he's inviting him into this incredible experience. He's calling him to this really phenomenal thing where Abram is going to leave what is comfortable and familiar, and he's going to go wherever it is that God directs him. So look at verse 1. It says, the Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. So it is a move from his country, his people, and his family to a place that God will later disclose To him, but God is inviting him in this moment to be this individual that God sets his affections on, and Abram is able to therefore be a vehicle of God's blessing to the world. But what it's what it's telling us then is that when God calls us, sometimes he's asking us to leave what we are familiar with. Now, this can be challenging because a lot of us want God to rubber stamp our plans. We say, God, I've got something I want to do. Will you please come along with me? And will you ensure that it is successful because this is what I really want to do. But here God is saying, I'm inviting you into my plan. And a part of that is going to require your willingness to part ways with what you really, really like. Your country, your people, your household. And I'm going to take you where I'm going to take you. So it is a move from the familiar and from the comfortable into the unknown, but it is going with God. And so God today might be speaking over some of us and reminding us, I am a God who communicates to you, and I want you to to hear my voice, and I want you to come along with me. And it will be exciting, but also challenging. Are you willing? Now, here's what's fascinating to me. Uh, It's very specific on the first three counts, but then the fourth thing is very obscure. He says, leave this specific thing, your country, leave this specific thing, your people, Leave this specific thing, your family, and go to a place, I'll show it to you later, right? It reminds me of um, when I was a young adult, I pioneered an action sports ministry, 
And I felt the call from God to do that, and me and my buddy decided this is what God was leading us to. And, we, you know, we're, we're in the Midwest, which I don't know if you're familiar with this, but it's not really the hub of action sports. Uh, surf and wake and skate culture, they all happen primarily in warm places. And so um, we're here and we're gathering, you know, our plan together, and then we, we're, we're going to try to get this team together. And we, we decided we probably need to go to a place where we can attract other Christian athletes to join the team and join us in this mission. And so we felt like God was calling us to Orlando. And uh, we loaded up our cars. I had a, a green diesel Volkswagen Jetta. And I put everything that I needed into that car, all my possessions that I would need. And my buddy had a truck, and he put all his possessions he would need in his truck. And we set out from here. And uh, some of you prayed over us and sent us off. But the truth is, and this was maybe a little secret that we had, we didn't know where we were going. We didn't have a place to stay when we, were, when we got there, but we believed that God was calling us to that experience, and so we got to Florida and had a couple different connections, and I remember driving my, my diesel Jetta, and this was way back in the day, so we had maps. We had an atlas, and I'm driving my car looking at a giant atlas that's filling my entire windshield, but I'm looking at this thing, and we're in Kissimmee, Florida at that point. We're totally lost, and we're trying to figure out okay, who are we going to connect with while we're here, and where are we going to stay, and what's this going to look like, and this is day one, and we're freaking out. I remember hitting the curb because I'm reading my map while driving, and my hubcap goes off into the, down the road past me, and then into oncoming traffic. It was a goner. Well, that's kind of like what, what God is doing here. He's saying, I want you to go, and I'm not showing you where you're going or what it's going to look like when you get there, but I'll show you when we arrive. And Abram doesn't go, well, hold on, God, I need some details, I need some clear and specific guidance here, I'm not sure if this is a good idea, in fact, it feels a little irresponsible, but God is saying, I'm going to call you into the unknown, and you can trust me, and when we get there, I'll show you that we are there. And so God is asking some of us today, are we willing to express that kind of faith? Are we willing to take those necessary steps that God is inviting us into even if we don't have a clear picture of the future. That's what it feels like right now in my life and in the life of the church. It feels like we're going into the unknown and God is going to begin saying, we're moving in this direction. And we'll say, okay, well, what does that mean exactly? What does that look like? What does that entail? And God says, just trust me. Trust the process. I'm with you. I'll care for you. I will provide for you to button up that story. Uh, I reached out to a pastor that I had heard speak at a conference and he and his family welcomed us into his home and then set us up with a couple from his church. And we lived with them for uh, about half a year as we started that ministry. So if you ever want to flatter a conference speaker, show up at the door doorstep and invite yourself to live with them. Um, <laughs> might work, might not. <laughs> but here we've got God inviting Abram into this radical experience of obedience, and he moves, he goes. He listens, and then God speaks this incredible word of blessing over him. He speaks this reality. He says in verse 2, he says, I'll make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God is saying, I'm taking initiative now, and I'm going to do something in and through you and this is going to be a phenomenal reality. You are going to experience the provision of God, the blessing of God five different times in these few verses. God is reiterating this reality that he, God, is going to bless Abram. Now, the context is what makes this even more significant because if, you, if you're just reading the book of Genesis from the start, Genesis 1 to 11 gives us kind of the big picture of humanity, and it's not good. And then Genesis chapter 12, many argue that this is kind of a very significant turning point in all of human history. But in the first 11 chapters, you've got humanity rejecting God. Humanity says, we don't need you, and that's sin. We don't need you, God. We'll, be, we'll make our own choices. We'll make our own decisions. We'll chart our own path. And the effects of that are devastating. In fact, Adam and Eve rebel against God. Their kids then literally kill each other. Uh, Cain kills Abel. 
And then it continu- as humanity continues to progress, we find God saying, I'm deeply grieved because the inclination of every human heart is wicked all the time. And then God reveals his judgment. He saves a man by, by uh, grace. You know, Noah had favor in the eyes of the Lord and there's judgment, but Noah and his family is saved. And then humanity is in a sense rebooted, but sin persists. Because it wasn't just something that was out there in the world, it was in the boat as well with the people who were spared from the judgment. And so humanity progresses, but you just get the sense that sin is the problem. It is the human condition that needs a remedy. And then you get to chapter 11, and you've got humanity rallying together, and here's what they're trying to do. Let's build something so impressive that God will notice. Let's make ourselves great. Let's make our name great. Let's make a structure that's so great that it'll provide provision and protection for us. And that plan is frustrated because it is in opposition to God. And God says, this is not okay for humanity to go its own way and try to make its own, to try to bless itself. And so that plan is frustrated, but then it turns a corner and we get to Genesis chapter 12 And God says, everything that humanity was trying to do on its own, with its own hands, through its own strength and ingenuity, I will do for you. I will bless you. I will make you a great nation. Humanity's trying to do that on its own, show how impressive it is. I'm going to do that for you. You're going to become this expansive nation. I will make your name great. Everyone's trying to position themselves and jockey so that their name is revered, but I'm going to do that for you. Your name, Abram, is going to be revered throughout all of human history. And I will provide and protect you along the way. So God is speaking here, and God is taking initiative, and he is saying, I am setting my affection on you for the sake of the many. So my question for us today is, are we entrusting ourselves to God? Because The reality is most of us are doing the same thing that humanity has been doing from the beginning. We're trying to make ourselves great on our own terms. We're trying to make ourselves great without reference to God. And what God is inviting us to today is to entrust ourselves to him, to say, I believe that God can give me everything that I need. And I will follow him and I will follow his leadership and his guidance. And maybe my life will look like like Abram. Abram didn't even experience all of the fruit of those blessings in his lifetime. It happened after the fact. So maybe me trying to make my name so great in this moment isn't the best project. Maybe entrusting myself to God will be the way that I can have a legacy that lasts beyond me. That's what we need to be thinking about today. Well, this call is also a call to mission. Look at verse 3 at the end there. It says, And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. I am calling you, Abram. I'm calling you, people of God, for this reason. It's not just about you. It's about people beyond you. All the nations of the earth will be blessed through you. Abram becomes the vehicle of blessing because he is the carrier of the promises of God. He, his descendants become the Israelites, the people of God, and they have the words of God, and they are the people through which the Savior himself will come. So the call is a call to mission. Abram is called to be this vehicle of blessing, and it's important that we understand this. The the blessings of God are, are not meant to simply flow to us and stay there. They're supposed to flow through us to other people. Missionaries will talk about it like this. They'll say, look, if the blessings stop with you, it actually gets messed up. They've talked about it like this before. It's like, a, it's like flowing water. Flowing water can be clean and healthy and provide for all sorts of things. But when water gets diverted into a stagnant area, it becomes a cesspool. And what could have been good and blessing and, you know, enriching to other people down the line, it becomes this kind of murky mess. And that's what happens when Christians think the blessings of God are all supposed to come directly to me and just stay right here. And we miss the opportunity to be the channel of blessing to other people in our lives. God is inviting us again today to be the missionary people of God. 
there is a culture out there that God wants to give us blessing to reach other people. And so we need to be thinking through those implications of what does it look like for me to be a vehicle and a channel of God's blessing to other people. But God is inviting us into that. In fact, the New Testament explains it like this, Galatians 3. This is the Apostle Paul describing Genesis chapter 12, and he puts it like this. Scripture foresaw that God would justify Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. God saw how this was going to work, that the nations would come to faith, and therefore he announced the gospel in advance to Abraham. Here's the gospel, Genesis 12, 3. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Here's what God is doing, and he's speaking this now through Paul much later on. God is saying, here is the good news of the gospel. I have made promises to you, Abraham, but it is for the sake of the world. Your, your election is for the sake of missions. And so the people of God have to understand this calling that we have. We are invited into the blessings of God, but it's not just for us. It's for others. So will you entrust yourself to God? Will you believe that he will give you a name and a greatness and a protection and he'll do all of that, not just for you, but for others around you? Will you be a conduit for God's blessing to the world? Will you please think through what would it look like to engage with the world in a way that commends God to it? All right, the call of God and now the commitment to God. The commitment to God. Look at verses 4 and following. So Abraham went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. So God says, I'm going to do this for you. And Abraham immediately responds. Abraham went. He was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. See, having heard the voice of God, Abraham responds with obedience of faith. He says, okay, if that's true, I'll go wherever you're going to lead me. If that's true, I don't need to know the final destination, but I'm going to believe that you're going to see me through this experience. And so he takes everything that he owns and all of his possessions and all of his people, and they just set out in the direction that God is sending them. And it's a beautiful thing. It's how Christians ought to respond. It's how believers ought to respond to the voice of God. Okay, if you're speaking God, my natural inclination should be to obey. Not to question, not to hesitate, not to try to barter with God. Okay, I'll do that if you do this for me. But no, if God says something to us, we should be the kind of people who say, whatever that is, no matter how challenging or frightening it may seem, I want to go in that direction. If God is speaking to me, I want to go. And maybe God is speaking to some of us and calling us to very hard things these days. And I hope that we would be the kind of people who respond with obedience of faith. And we say, okay, I don't, I don't know what this is going to look like, but I'm going to go. And it's really incredible here that you, you, hopefully you notice he is taking everything with him. He, he is not leaving kind of a trace behind where he could go, yeah, I'm going to go in this direction, but if things don't work out, I'm just going to go back home. You know, nowadays, missionaries, we have it very easy because travel is accessible. And so people will buy a ticket that takes them to a location where they're going to do a mission. And then they also will sometimes have a return ticket in hand, maybe without a date on it, but they know I can go there and I can come back and and I can even leave stuff behind because I'm going to go there for a season and maybe return. That's not how it always was. In fact, uh, if you've read about missionaries uh, in early church history, they would pack their belongings in a coffin. They would take everything that they were going to need to go there and they'd put it in the coffin that they planned to be buried in while there. And there was no return flight. They would hop on a ship with the intention to spin themselves for the sake of the gospel. That's the kind of thing that we see here with Abram. He is taking everything and going in the direction that God wants him to go. And he is walking by faith. So later on, the writer to the Hebrews would put it like this. We'll put it up on the screen. It says, By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his his inheritance, he obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. He was willing to go. This was an act of faith, but when he was called, 
He obeyed and he went. May that be true of us as well. Would we obey and go where God is calling us to? And then you see here in our text, you see this life on the move. You recognize then that this, this following of God is actually a transient experience. So Abraham, even in this brief text that we have in front of us, he's just moving around. Look at verse 6. Abraham traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Marah at Shechem. There's movement there. He's, he's traveling with God. He's went, but now he's still on the move. Look at verse 8. From there, he went toward the hills east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent. Then look at verse 9. It says, then Abram set out, and he continued toward the Negev. So he's moving around with God. And here's what I want you to feel. To be people of faith means that you are on the move. It means that you're willing to take that posture of wherever it is that God is leading me, that's where I'm going. And it actually changes the way in which we relate to the world. Um, the language, I'll show it here, I'll show it to you here in just a moment, but the language that, that becomes kind of the way of describing the people of God, it's language like this. They are pilgrims and strangers. By the New Testament, it gets formalized. This is who we are as the church. Peter writes his letter to the church, and he says, we are aliens and strangers. Or another way to translate it, we're sojourners. It means that we are temporary residents. We have another location, another destination to which we're headed, but in the meantime, we're here, but the way that we relate to here is a little bit different because we are sojourners. So listen to it now from the writer to the Hebrews. He says it like this. By faith, Abram made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Okay, so Abraham is relating to the world now in a different way. He's, he's got movement in his life. He's going wherever God is leading him. And so now when he lands in the promised land, he's living in tents and he's living as this stranger, this foreigner in, in this new place. He's a sojourner. He, he's looking forward, not just to the physical land itself, but he's looking forward to the city whose architect and builder is God. He's living as a citizen of heaven which is the way the New Testament puts it. So we, church family, we have to begin to relate to culture in this way. We are sojourners. It means that we're here and we're invested here. We care deeply about our society. We care deeply about the direction that society is going. But we have a city, a destination that we're headed toward, and it's much better than here could ever be. And so we look forward to that. We look forward to the city of God, whose architect and builder is God himself. And while we're here, we live in this kind of transient way. We say, this is not, this is not it. I'm invested here. I care about here. I pray for here. I, I do everything that I can to be present here, but I am a citizen of heaven. So church family, that call that is given to Abraham becomes a commitment of Abraham to say, I am with God and I am following him wherever he leads me. May you say that as well. Finally, communion with God, and that's just a big word to say relationship, to commune with God, to communicate with God. And you see that at the end in verses six to nine. You see this relationship that Abraham is experiencing with the living God. So verses six and seven, at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the people who had appeared to him. So there's this relationship. You begin to see it playing out that Abram is dealing with God now and he's experiencing something of communication with God and worship of God. But, but notice too that there are people there. So this is your land, but it's already occupied. And again, it's that reminder of mission. There are people there who don't know God yet. So you're in this new location. How are you going to behave? Well, you've got a calling. You're meant to be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. Well, here they are. How are you going to, how are you going to interact with them? And again, church family, we need to think about that. We need to be able to say, look, I want to be that vehicle of blessing to the nations. I'm not just going to sit around and boo-hoo that, that the society isn't what I want, but I'm going to actually begin to make that shift now to think, 
how can I behave as a missionary here? How can I love and serve and bless people here for their sake? Well, God speaks and reminds him of the promise, and now he fills in some of the details. He's going to become a great nation, but now he's saying it's your offspring that will receive this land, that will inherit this land. And this uh, general promise of Abraham becoming a great nation is now getting more and more specific. And later on in Genesis 15, he'll say it like this. God will say to, to Abraham, a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. You're going to have a child. But listen, he's 75 when this project begins. And now God is saying, you're going to have a child and that child will be the heir. And then Genesis 15, verse 6, this is an incredible and a very important passage. It says, Abram believed the Lord about that promise that he's going to have a descendant, an heir from his own body, and then God credited it to him as righteousness. So, Abram, through you all the nations are going to be blessed, and a part of that blessing is this promised child. And Abraham believes that good news and it is credited to him as righteousness. Listen, this is the essence of faith. This is what Christianity is all about. God says something, and here's what it means to be a Christian. You hear his voice and you believe it. He makes a promise and you say, I entrust myself. I believe in that promise. Now, at this part of the Bible story, it's you know, it's kind of vague. You don't really understand all the details of it, but it continues to unfold and be built out, and all of a sudden you begin to realize that promise that was made to Abraham actually comes true in Jesus Christ. The promise is something like this, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in that son, in Jesus Christ, would not perish, but would have everlasting life. That is Christianity. It is to hear the voice of God and believe it. It's to understand the promise that God is making and to trust it. And when you do that, it is credited to you as righteousness. Your belief in Christ is, is now, it becomes a gift of the righteousness of Christ to you. And so that is what Abram is experiencing here in Genesis. Well, he believes the promise, and he continues to have this ongoing relationship with God. So look at verse 8. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord, and he called on the name of the Lord relationship with God. But here's what's really incredible. Notice the difference between the living conditions of Abram and the artifacts that he's leaving behind. Abram lives in a tent, but he's building permanent structures for God. He's living in a tent as a sojourner. He's traveling wherever God is leading him, but having dealt with God, he's leaving behind these permanent artifacts, these altars, these places of worship that he's building for God there. And I want to encourage you in this moment, would you please build permanent structures in these temporary times? And the, the fact is, throughout the entire history of the Bible and history of humanity, we get this exactly backwards. What do we find ourselves doing? Building our own projects, trying to make our stuff great, leaving the things of God unattended. But here we see this Incredible vision of what would it look like if we were committed to the things of God. And our stuff feels transient, not as important. In fact, one of the prophets, he scolded the people of God because he said, look, the temple of God, the, the house of God is in disrepair, and you guys are living in paneled houses. Is that okay? Is that okay with you? And the critique really is meant to cause us to wonder at how much time and energy are we giving to the things of God? And I hope that we, church family, that we would prioritize the stuff of God right now. I hope that we would begin thinking through, how can I leave a spiritual legacy? How can I invest myself in something that will have a permanence beyond me? How can I worship God in this moment and make that such a, an important feature of my life that the other ambitions kind of fade in the background? But I want to be committed to the things of God, so I want to worship him. He built an altar to the Lord, and he called on the name of the Lord. So let's be those kinds of people who relate to God and say, look, I, I don't know what the future holds. It's uncertain, but here's what I'm going to do in the meantime. 
I'm going to worship God. I'm going to pray to God. I'm going to invest myself in him and his ways. In verse 9, then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Well, let's wrap this thing up now. Here's what we've seen together. God speaks to us, and he gives us his promises, and he wants us to hear those promises and entrust ourselves to them. We should be a people who obey by faith, that when we hear the voice of God, our inclination is to say, okay, I'll do that. Whatever that is, I'm going to go with God. And we should be sojourners in this land, believing that we have an inheritance that is to come, and it will exceed even what we can hope for or imagine. And then we can move into this unknown future with a known God, with great confidence in who he is and what he's doing and his ability to bless along the way. So let's pray as the band comes and uh, we'll continue to worship this great God. Lord, we thank you for your promises. We thank you for the way that you communicate to us through your word. We thank you for the good news of the gospel that is Jesus Christ crucified and risen for us. We pray, Lord, that everyone who can hear my voice right now is placing their faith in him for salvation and experiencing the gift of righteousness. And Lord, we we ask that you would make us your missionary people, that we wouldn't just look for ways for the blessings to come and land on us and just stay here, but we would think through, how can we do life on mission so that more and more and more people come to know this incredible God? Lord, let us walk by faith along with you. In Jesus' name, amen.